We're just going to chuck some headphones on so that we can hear what's going on. <coughs> yeah, I can hear you. Sweet. So, um, yeah, hopefully, uh, I don't know how much you guys actually got to watch, but um, yeah, it turned out to be a pretty good race. Uh, one of the, the biggest talking points before, before the start of Dakar was definitely the route. Um, about it being in one country and being mostly sand and I think, I don't know about you guys, but it turned out to be way better than I thought it was going to be from like a, a watching perspective. Um, it didn't seem to take anything away from the race. Um, but ultimately the story that I think is going to come away from this year more than anything is the fact that Honda failed to win again. And I don't want to brag about that, but I called it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, I think that's kind of the opening talking point really is why why didn't they win? Like, what are they doing wrong that they keep doing every year for the last, what is it, six years now that they've been going to Dakar? Seven years. When was the first year they went? 2012? Maybe? 2011, Ish. something like that. And they, they, they just can't do it. So, <laughs> yeah. We're going to, why, why do you think that is? Uh, I, I don't think, you know, for me, I don't think anything's changed from what we said two weeks ago. That The, the problem that Honda's got is that they're not a team. You know, they're, they're all individuals and they're all kind of fighting for each other and it doesn't seem like the, the guys looking after them are working as a team either. They, they just haven't got that, that kind of family feeling that uh, the KTM clearly has, you know, that they're, although that might have changed by the end this year. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, that's all it is for me is they just don't seem to, you know, they, 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 they had it in the bag with their one rider, but it, it did end up only him left riding. So, uh, you know, when something went wrong, there was no one there for him, and that's kind of the end of the game. Cool. So, um, yeah, I think, I think the best way to do this is to probably break down the race day by day because I think uh, more so than any Dakar I remember watching in the last five years this race changed literally every day by like the lead was changing by 10 minutes a day in the overall it was pretty unbelievable and probably that was a little bit because there was so much sand it was easy to pass it was easier to catch people maybe um so yeah i'll let you Sai. for those that haven't don't don't know this Sai loves a stat um <laughs> he knows everything you could ever want to know about who finished where and everything so i'm gonna let you take the lead on this <laughs> um yeah, like Claire said, it was super unpredictable for me. Um, start from the first one, Bereda, my, uh, <laughs> my favorite bastard let me down again. <laughs> but um, yeah, he smoked it on the first stage. And, um, but yeah, the, the thing with Bereda and the thing with Honda in general, if it wasn't when he went out, then it would have been another time. But um, yeah, it was a bit later on in stage three. But right from the start, all the top guys, it was a short special, it was 84 kilometers. Um, all the top guys were there or thereabouts in that first one. Um, a little bit of a kind of twist to it was that normally the prologue, you don't really want to do well on it because then you have to lead out on the first day. But on this year, the cars led out on the first proper day. So winning the prologue, and you know, is an 84K prologue, so there's a bit of time to make up there. It was actually a, a benefit to those guys. So there's a lot of them pushing for the win, and that's why you kind of you saw a lot of the top guys move towards the front of the classification in that prologue. And um, yeah, like I said, Bereda smashed it on the first one, but yeah, all came undone a little bit later on. Yeah, I, I think one of the coolest things about um, this year being so sand-based as well um, was that I feel like for the first time in, since it left Africa, it's been a super tactical race. The, there were so many kind of curveballs where it was possible for guys to win a stage and then the next day not lose any time. And that's a really good example of that. Like, I don't think we've had that since it went to South America. It's become way more of a kind of free for all of everyone just trying to win a stage when they can win a stage and kind of trying to figure out who's fast and who's not. And this year it seemed like maybe they all had more of a strategy. And that, that was part of that, like Bereda trying to win the first day. He won it by quite a lot in an 84K stage. It was like, it was like two, two minutes. Two minutes, something yeah. like that, which is, which is a lot. You know, two minutes in like a 50 kilometer stage is a lot, you know, it's a, uh, yeah. Um, kind of one of the other things you've got written down there is that Ricky Brabbit came out swinging from the start as well. Yeah, absolutely. So last year, um, he kind of he was just a bit nowhere in the in the first week, but in the second week, he, he turned a, he kind of flicked a switch really in the second week last year, and then in, he's kind of in 2018, he didn't do the American Outdoor Series, the um, 
Hare and Hound series and the Nationals and stuff like that. Just focused on rally. And um, I think that paid off for him. He got third in Morocco in October. And, um, and yeah, that would have been a bit of a catalyst for him. A bit of a kind of reassurance so he can run with those guys at the front. And yeah, he came out firing on the first stage and kind of only went faster from there. So one of the biggest talking points about this year's race as well was the, the kind of issue of safety, especially amongst the top guys, about them trying to figure out how to make the race safer. And one of the points that was raised by a few riders, specifically uh, the French rider Xavier de Soutre, he raised the point that he hates riding after the cars have been through the stage. And the second stage, they did exactly that. They started the cars first. And probably you've spent more time behind cars than anyone else in this room. Thanks. So, Ever. <laughs> <laughs> mostly because you rode terrible bikes. Um, so why why is that a problem? Like why is that such a big deal? Why are those guys so upset by that? No, it made me happy that they were upset. It's good for them to have to see how <laughs> miserable it is back then. It was kind of yeah, see, seeing those guys that are sort of super fit coming at the end of the stage when they've had to ride through the, the track as it's been destroyed by the cars gave me personally a lot of joy. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that's sort of the most difficult when, you're, you know, when you have a problem on Dakar as a kind of normal person and you end up uh, that day behind cars and especially if there's one or two trucks come through because they, they totally destroy the, the terrain. You know, when, when 10, 20, even 50 bikes go down the terrain, you see sort of the marks on the dunes there. They, they leave some marks and it's a little bit harder. But when the cars go through with 400 horsepower and, you know, all driving through all their wheels, they, they totally destroy the ground. And, and um, I think this year, a lot of the time where it was through the dunes and you saw, you know, big valleys through the dunes, uh, you know, you, you, there's, there's one idea, it looks like you can go anywhere in the desert, but there's really sort of quite a narrow corridor of what the, the best line is through there. And the best line gets decimated by those, by those vehicles. So then you've either got to take a, a longer line around through, through more difficult, more off camber, more, more tricky dunes, or you go through the, the optimal sort of passage through the dunes, but it's been destroyed by the cars. And, and it's super physical then, and you kind of saw that with those guys coming in and looking like they'd done a hard day's work, which, as I say, was quite joyous for me. <laughs> <laughs> Long may it continue. How pleasant of you. Um, hey, you see I like pe making people suffer. You do. <laughs> yeah, that was a that little was bit of an eye-opener <laughs> as to my childhood. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, uh, for us personally as well, like, we love watching this race, as you can tell. Um, and one of our favorite riders the last few years has been the same guy that was complaining about his, uh, uh, complaining about riding behind the cars. And it's kind of ironic that he complains about seeing things being a little bit dangerous because he is by far the wildest rider in the whole race. It's unbelievable how loose he is. I don't know how he got to the finish. I don't know how he got to the finish. He didn't make it last year after catapulting off the top of Dunes for two weeks and being wild as hell. Just to, just to prove that point, we're, uh, we're gonna try and make this Oh, no, I'm failing to... <laughs> that's like, that's a normal piece of riding for him. He has no issue with that all of the time. A little bit ironic. Um, so yeah, that day was won by KTM and Matthias Volkner. Um, but Brabeck, Bereda held on to the overall lead. Um, he started out in a really good position for day three. And this is pretty much where, like, I think the start of the race for Honda goes completely Pete Tong because their lead rider, I don't think there's any doubt that he's their lead rider. He's got 23 stage wins. He's, like, the, the second winningest rider to never win the Dakar, if that makes sense. That's not even a word. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he's won more stage wins than anyone else that hasn't won the Dakar other than the legendary Jordi Acherons. Um And, yeah, he, he basically he went out from... I mean, it's easy to sit here and say this, but it seems like a really silly mistake to have made in kind of a difficult situation. Obviously, we don't lead that race out very often, so it's easy for me to say this, but basically he made a, it, it seems like he made a navigation error and he ended up in a ravine that he couldn't ride out of and he was like, no, that's enough, I'm done. You can see it, we'll play the interview with him immediately after he gets helicoptered out, he's kind of walking around and he just seems kind of nonchalant about it. Um, it frustrates the hell out of me. It frustrates you. Yeah. Why does it frustrate you? Because he just gives up. It's, <laughs> oh, 
Let's see. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give it a little play and you can uh, judge for yourselves. I don't know how this Chromecast thing works. It's really... <laughs> There we go. So what he's done there is basically a waypoint has come live on his GPS, so the arrows come up, and he saw, well, I'll just follow the arrow straight, it's really thick fog, and he's not paid attention, enough attention to the track in front of him, and yeah, he's paid the price for it. I think there's two sides to that. One that looks like a person that didn't really want to get out of a ravine that bad. Like, you saw the footage of him in the helicopter immediately afterwards, not a drop of sweat on his head. And, and maybe it's a different scenario because we're not factory riders, but I can't imagine a scenario in which I pretty much wouldn't try my hardest and every end piece of energy I had to get out of that hole. Do you know? I think like, for him, though, he's, he's in that race to, to win it. And if, if he's not going to win it, like we said last time, if guys aren't in the top three, they don't care. Or they, there's not much motivation to be like a finisher. I'll be like, well done, you came fourth. Fantastic. Whereas, you know, there's no prize money or there's no nice trophy and there's no um, there's no name in the record books or anything like that so I think if he's st been stuck there for an hour and obviously he's going to be gutted about it but there's no point in him kind of carrying on if it's going to be fighting for maybe scraping a top 10 kind of thing. Except he's, it's day three and that's what he's done multiple times before mm. had some mess up early in the race and he, he has been a guy that's been prepared to dig deep to, fo to, to finish. He, he rode 120 kilometers through to dunes in Bolivia at, at, yeah. with, one hand, with one hand, he snapped his handlebar clean in half and he rode the last 120 k's of the stage with, uh, with only one side of the handlebar and the other hand just holding the broken piece with the clutch in it. And still came and, fifth Yeah, and smoked stage. the rest of us, so, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and, um, then, the you know, and then he towed for six hours or something two days later. So, he's, he, you know, he, he does try to finish. And, and that's why he's got so many stage wins, like, like Lel said, 20, whatever it is. Mm. Um, because there was still another seven days of rallies. He could have won another seven days. And, yeah, I, I, don't, I think it's unfair to... I'm not a, I'm not a fan because I don't like the fact that he messes up every year. But... By the same token, I, I actually think you guys are being unfair because he has dug deep before. And, and I think, I know you're Mr. Charles Neil, and you think you can get out of every scenario, but we're, you know, the, the I'd desert. I'd be stripping my bike yeah, and yeah, taking sure, it out to the top. Sure. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sure we all agree. We'd do whatever you can to get out of there, but I don't think you can, you know, you don't know how sheer that was. And the terrain in, in the desert, it's hard to explain, but it could have literally been a canyon. You know, if you throw your bike off the edge of the Grand Canyon, I don't care you are, you're not getting back up the wall. I think this is coming around to our strongly formed, ill-formed Ill opinions. Yeah. But just for <laughs> reference, he rode 115 kilometers three years ago with that handlebar and still finished fifth. And this year, he went a little bit the wrong way and got in a helicopter. <laughs> I, th I think this year a factor is like I think he's, he's in eighth or ninth Dakar this year. Yeah. I you know every, every time every year there seems to be something going wrong with him, and I don't know maybe he's just a bit fed up with it. It's just like what now kind of thing. Maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. That year he was a bit earlier on in his career had semi good results to then, and um, yeah, still had that had that hunger. But uh, yeah, we'll see. It'll be interesting to see what he does next year. I suppose that comes back around to the conversation of like what are Honda doing? Like if their if their lead rider is in that mindset, they've kind of got a bit of an endemic problem, um, and that's probably the reason that they're they're not winning. 
So, yeah. yeah. It's not a very exciting conversation. It sounds like we're being a little bit negative about Honda here because we are. Um, <laughs> but they didn't win. So, yeah, stage four was, um, was, it seemed like at the time it was probably going to be one of the most important stages for the whole rally. And um, we kind of, in our last podcast, we picked it out as being crazy important. Um, and mostly because it was one of the few opportunities you get in Dakar where if you won the stage, your basically disadvantage of leading out the next day was wiped because the next day was a mass start. Um, and yeah, it was absolutely dominated by Ricky Brabeck. For the first time in his career, he's come out and shown not just like that he was good, but that he was unbelievably good. You know, yeah. he won by a really solid margin. He took the lead overall. Um, and then suddenly the whole race started to take shape. And yeah, we wouldn't have said that last year after last year's Dakar. Like he was kind of, he was good, but he was still very much a Honda support rider for sure. But, um, but yeah, this year, like Claire said, just waypoint after waypoint after waypoint. I think he won. Check my stats. Si, like we said, Sai loves a stat. He, wow. He's basically gone through you guys and marked out every waypoint that was won by every rider for the whole race. This is a five tab spreadsheet. <laughs> insane I, I didn't do this when I was on the clock for off-road skills promise okay. <laughs> uh, oh sorry uh, <laughs> technology's left me um, so basically across the 10 stages of, of Dakar there were um, 63 kind of recorded waypoints through the tracking system and stuff like that um, Brabic won 15 of them. Um, he was the most. The second place was Toby and Matthias Walkner. They both won nine each. And then after that, kind of the usual suspects, Quintanilla, Bereda, Sunderland, De Soldre. But yeah, Brabic just, and it, it wasn't just the fact that he won so many, but he was winning waypoints nearly every day. The only one he didn't win was stage five, um, which was the mass start, which you wouldn't expect him to, because he's you know, he won stage four, crew stage five, that's how it works. Yeah. So he didn't want a waypoint on that one. And yeah, that's it really. Wow. He's so consistent. It was really, really impressive. Mm. I think one of the coolest things about Dakar that they, they do a really bad job of showing on the TV from my experience as well is, uh, is that it's a much harder race than people think technically. Um, you always kind of looks like it's just blokes riding across the desert. They show that footage on the TV because it looks good and it's people going fast and the sand dunes and they kind of never really focus on the difficult stuff until someone really messes it up. But there's a lot of it. There's some really big downhills. It's always really rocky. It's a challenging race and it's kind of hard to describe to people. But fortunately, they, uh, they got a little bit of footage of it this year. This is Sam Sunderland. He finished third. It's his job to ride a motorbike. And... Uh, yeah, he spent about a minute making it look really, really hard. We got the clutch. <laughs> he should come on a level one. <laughs> I'm going to tell Sam that. <laughs> please don't. Please don't tell him that. Yeah, Dakar is easy just to cruise across the dunes. Uh, I would have thought his heart rate is through the roof right now. <laughs> he is it's blowing. Probably, uh, the way he rides off on the seat in a minute tells you where he's, where he's at in life. <laughs> Feet out on the back of the seat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyone that ever thinks that Dakar's a nice gentle ride in the park, they're uh, solely misguided. Um, so other than that, actually the biggest talking point of that day was nothing to do with the lead riders in the race at all. Um, I don't know how many of you know about this, but there was a guy that tried to ride this year or entered and rode the first four days called Nicola Duto. Um, and he's the first paraplegic rider to ever try to race the Dakar, um, which is an incredible thing. On a bike. On a bike, that is, not in a car. Um, yeah, and it was an incredible thing. And he's clearly, a, like, was before his accident an incredibly good rider yeah. and still is a good rider. He's good enough to have done what you're required to do to get to the race. Um, and, uh, yeah, he was disqualified through some pretty controversial circumstances, it, at least that it seemed that way anyway. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so he, the con kind of condition of his entry, I guess, was that he entered, um, but obviously if he, if he falls over, he can't pick himself up again. So he had three mates basically on bikes as well. They entered as a team of four and um, 
yeah, first off, is an absolutely incredible effort just to get there, just to get to that point. Like, unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I really hope he kind of picks himself up after this and kind of cracks on with it and, and does more racing for sure. Um, but yeah, on stage four, basically, um, one of his support riders, his bike broke down. Um, they all stopped to help fix the bike. Couldn't get it going. Eventually got it going. Stopped about 20 k's later. Um, it was starting to get dark, so basically they had some organizers um, there with them, um, and they asked them, "It's getting really dark. Can we go on the road to the overnight bivouac, which is the marathon bivouac, and fix the bike there?" And uh, apparently they have audio recording and video recording of the organizer saying, "Yes, you can go on the road. That's fine. Don't worry about it." Um, when they got to the overnight bivouac, um, they were basically told by the organizers that they were disqualified for cutting the course, and the organizers just, um, they just wouldn't budge on that, so they were excluded. Um, it'd be interesting to see the organization's side of things, because we only hear um, Nicholas' side, but f for me, I, I feel for him so much, like it is absolutely horrible what, what he must be kind of going through to be kind of taking that much effort to get there and be told that you can't continue. But at the same time, he's an experienced racer, and he knows that it doesn't matter what the organization say, like, you can't cut the course. It's just, you just can't do it, especially at a race like Dakar. Yeah. I mean, you know ASO probably better than anyone. You've probably got a better insight than this than anyone. But to me, it seems like they have the right to, to do what they need to do to look out, to make the race as safe as possible for everyone else. Um, yeah, well, I, th I think we'll end up talking about the same kind of thing when we you know, get on to the, the other rule issues that came up for the, for the top riders, but it, it's got to be the same for whether you're a top rider or whether you're someone at the back of the pack, the rule book's got to be the, the rule book, and it, it is, you know, it's the same, uh, the rules are very clear, you know, it's a, it's a manual that's published like that, and, and also they, they, they I wouldn't call it. that clear. Like, if, you, if well, there's I, a rule book <laughs> that's like more than four <laughs> pages, that's not clear. But they do always say at the, the main briefing before the start of the event that the one thing that will get you excluded from the event is not doing the entire course. You know, that, that's, that's the 100% thing that to get that finishers medal, you have to do 100% of the course. And, and just because, uh, a, you know, a, a peripheral official, which is, you know the the guys that are in the four wheel drives and all that that are out there. They're you know they're helpers on the event, but they're not part of the jury. They're not part of the the FIM or the FIA decision making process. They're just a bloke in a four wheel drive because that guy says, "Yeah, do it. You want mate? Drive down the road. I don't care." Um, you know, it's the same as the guy on the door here telling you what you can do. Yeah, you can come in and sit down at a table. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't change the the rules of the event. And unfortunately. Like I, I mean, I think the guy's incredible. If you watch some footage of him on the internet riding, riding a motorbike, how he does, and it is tragic that he went out. But, but you know, he went out because he didn't follow the course. Uh, for me, the kind of obviously it was just one of his support riders uh, whose bike broke down. But and by all means, like everyone stopped to try and fix it for 30 minutes, something like that. But there comes a point in the day where it's like. All right, if we don't leave now, we're not going to make it to that overnight bivouac, and we're going to have to, like, going to have to leave you behind, kind of thing. And well, especially yeah. without being mean, you can't really walk, so it's quite hard for him to to walk around and help with that stuff when you're like sat in the desert. So he's literally yeah. like sat there. And and if you leave one of his support guys there, helpful. he's still got two support riders to to help him out. And yeah, and yeah. If, if it's that or not finishing, then yeah, I don't know. However, the dude can't touch the floor. And he tried to ride Dakar and he got four days in, which I think is like the most ridiculous thing in the world. Unreal. Unreal. And like, it's not like it's just his legs that don't work. It's like everything below his belly button. So below there, he has like no muscular strength at all. So how he even sits upright is a miracle, let alone ride a dirt bike. And when you watch him ride, he can legitimately awesome. ride a dirt bike. Like he is really good. He deserved to be there. It's just a shame that he went out from what is ultimately like a little bit of a silly mistake. I mean, it's a hindsight thing and, you know, sometimes ASO aren't very clear. I definitely had a conversation with them one day where they told me I was going the wrong way and I definitely wasn't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's a thing to learn from. Um, so, next up, 
day five, the last day before the rest day, which is a strange thing to say as well, to have a rest day after day five. Old mate over there is like, well, we didn't have a rest day for like 400 days in 1974. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the coolest things about it was the mass start on the beach. Like, I'm never going to get, I don't want to do one. I don't want to be a part of it because it's terrifying. But watching a mass start is super cool. I'll find it here somewhere. I'll see if I can make any, everything work. We'll just do this. Like watching 10 of the fastest rally riders in the world go full gas down a beach is never gonna get old. So cool. I love the guy on the back left there just being like a bit of a chicken as well. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> So good. Can we just go there now? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, Sam Sunderland, Britain's finest desert racer. Um, he won that day. And uh, Brabeck led into the rest day with, like, a pretty healthy lead. And like has happened a few years now, we've all been sat there like, whoa, it looks really good for Honda. They've finally figured it out. And they're definitely going to win this year because they've got a massive lead and it's all going well. But quick little fact, nobody in the last 10 years has won Dakar when they've been leading at the rest day. It doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen because it is a two-week race. Apart from Sam? Really? Apart from Sam. Yeah. Sam was the only one. Before that, it was like Mark Comer in 2010 or something. Yeah, it was a long time ago. It doesn't happen. And so kind of the race became what it was after that. The, the race started again after the rest day. It was won by Quintanilla. And unfortunately, Lorenzo Santolino, he rides for the Sherco sure. factory team. He had a really big crash. And it turned out to kind of be the worst accident that happened to any of the top guys this year. It wasn't particularly nice. Um, but yeah, there was some, it, was, it was one of the coolest things for me this year was to see the top guys like absolutely showing great spirit as well. They, you know, he crashed and every one of them stopped to check that he was all right. And they put mm -hmm. time into it and they looked after each other. And, it's kind of a cool thing about this kind yeah. of racing is that people do actually care about each other. Yeah. There was a really bad, bad crash in Supercross last week and heart, like one of the dude that crashed and broke his femur, his teammate literally almost rode over him and just rode off like he wasn't there. <laughs> and it's like the exact opposite here, you know, like these guys really care about each other. Um, and just yeah. to be clear as well, just like from a kind of tactics point of view, when if you're one of the top guys and the guy crashes in front of you, you stop, you stop to help him and say you're there 20 minutes or something like that, the other, the rest of the top guys are all cleaned off by that time, and you don't get to see what kind of pace they're running, and so you can't really judge it. Like on that day, on the day before, I think when Sunderland won, he wasn't planning to try and do well that day because he wanted a good start position the next day. So he kind of he helped out Gonzalez, who had um, hurt himself. I think it was Gonzalez. Yeah, yeah Gonzalez. Yeah. So he helped him out, and then obviously didn't have a, a marker for the pace then for the rest of the stage, so he just rode his pace and it ended up being too fast and he, and he won the stage. So yeah, it's, it's not, you know, they're doing it out. Yeah, basically them stopping, they are actually, they're missing out on kind of advantages by doing that, but they still do it because that's just what you do, so. I keep playing the wrong video. It is, it is just what you do, but also there's a penalty if you don't. Don't, ever, don't ever forget that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> And they can see that on the tracking if you go past someone that's down. Yeah. And and yeah, it's in the rules. Yeah. I think it's even up to exclusion for not doing it, but it's oh, definitely well, yeah. a penalty. And you do get dick points for being a you dick. Get, yeah, that's the bigger <laughs> penalty for sure. You would get called yeah. out on it on social media <laughs> afterwards. So day seven came around. The way it worked out is that Sam Sunderland won and closed the gap right up to the overall. He was only 10 minutes off the lead. But it kind of looked like it was Brabeck's race to lose. Like the way the stages were planned to play out, he'd like start one, do well in the next one, and just kind of had a really good pace. He had a solid lead. Um, yeah, and it kind of went as it should, apart from one thing that started to come up, and it, it came up on day three, but there was like a really big argument that started to happen between some of the riders and the car teams especially, and the organizers. And that was to do with an idea of, uh, of something called map men. And so all the big teams have a guy um, whose job it is to take the road book the night before, sit on Google Earth, and plan what the stage is gonna be for the day. And they use it supposedly to help with navigation. 
But what it's kind of started to turn out is that they use it to cheat. Um, and so on stage three, I think it was, at the end of the day, they put a bulletin out and they took all of the roadbooks off all of the top guys to check what they'd been, what notes they'd been adding to the roadbooks. They put this bulletin out and it basically said, uh, you're not allowed to add anything to the roadbook that shouldn't be there. So anything, any information you've gained from looking at Google Earth, any information that we haven't given you about the stage should not be there. Don't put it in or you're out, basically. The only thing they can put in there is stuff that they remember from being in that same place. And say a stage has gone through one se section of terrain twice um, in the rally, like it did this year, then they can add notes. Which is a that. super weird thing to say because I don't know how anyone like specifically remembers a specific kilometer of a piece of desert in the middle of nowhere. That's a really strange thing to. I do. <laughs> Maybe that's why I didn't win that challenge. <laughs> so yeah, this became a problem um, mostly because everybody else seemed to take it quite seriously and stop doing that. And then Honda's second kind of positioned rider, Kevin Benavidez, unbelievable rider, really like a genuine title threat. Um, he was caught, and was this on stage eight or stage seven? This was start of the eight. start of stage eight. So yeah. the next day, yeah. basically, he was caught at one of the checkpoints in the day with a load of extra notes taped to his bike, which weren't there in the morning. So he's deliberately concealed the information he's got, and then someone who's got way too much time on their hands on the internet. I'll show you. Basically mapped the whole stage from bits of roadbook he found and information he got from friends that were on the race. He mapped it all on Google Earth, took Kevin's information from his tank and mapped out exactly the changes that Kevin had made to his roadbook. And essentially, he was finding routes around the track that you shouldn't be using because they were easier. So one of them, I'll dig it up now, one of them is basically onto a beach. We have to do a little bit of confusing computer work. Oh, that's the wrong way. Bear with me a sec here. Uh, nope. So what Ben Vida's got fined for was, was not so much the having the notes there, but concealing them on the start line. I think the, the kind of ASO's description of his penalty was for unsportsmanlike behavior. So it was, it was just as much the fact that he concealed those notes as, as the fact that he made them in the first place. I'm uh, struggling with my computer situation here. So it kind of it kind of raised like a much much bigger question of, of actually that should they be allowed to have those people? Like all of the car teams kind of blew up about it. Well, most of them did. They got really upset because they're using their claim was that they're using those map men to kind of improve what the organizers give them. So they're looking on Google Earth and they're picking out landmarks and giving themselves things to pay attention to. But that's like in direct conflict with the situation that happened with Benavidez. And all of us privateers don't have that advantage. You know, the advantage we've got is that we've got tracks. We're not probably the first guy into the stage. If we are, I generally, I don't want to be because it's terrifying to lead stages out. Um, but do you think you should be allowed to have that advantage. Do you think that's part of the race? I mean, you've led, you led a stage for 100Ks one day. Like, do you, do you think it would be nice if you'd known exactly where you're going? And you guys did it in Sarah's rally, like you looked up where the stage was going every day. Do you think well, it should be there? On, on one of the days, yeah, but only because I remembered it from a couple of years ago and it was carnage, the navigation, so. And if I've got a choice between sleep and being on Google Earth, I'll probably sleep. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> it, at our level, it, it's, it's, um, if we've got time to do it and time to look, then great. But if not, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not something new, is it? It's something that mm -hmm. the big car teams, especially like the bike guys, it's pretty new for the bike teams, but definitely the car teams have been doing it for, for forever. I, I think the, the question isn't about how much time they spend or what resources they use to to make the navigation better, for me, it is just down to whether they've broken the rules and cheated. And, and that's what it, you know, that's what from your man that you found on the internet, it looks like Benavides has deliberately cheated because he's, he's taken a different route. He's not followed the route. And then the whole thing is all those riders, you know, they're also very, uh, you know, they're, 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 they are risking their lives the speed they're riding at, no question about it. And so then the whole safety thing comes into question. If you, if the organizers, as it looks like with Benavides thing, if it's true, is 
you know, their route is through the dunes beside the beach and he's found a way to drop off the dunes onto the beach and then go wide open down the beach. But now he's got no danger markers. So he might have a new route, but he's got no danger markers. And if he then crashes down the beach at 100 mile an hour and they don't, they don't expect him to be there, the helicopters are two kilometers inland, like that, that, that's where it's all not only, uh, you know, not only a, a cheating thing, it's like it's undoing all the safety processes they put in place to, to help those guys, to help all of us, but to help those guys. And yeah, I, th I think that's where they've got to decide, because after this happened, I had a look back in this year's rules, because they have changed since the last time I went them. And it, you know, the, the rule always used to be that you had to be within a certain corridor. Um, you know, that's changed over the years, but let's say three kilometers either side of the roadbook notes, as long as you were still going through the, the actual waypoints that are in the GPS. But the way they've written the rules now, it again is a little bit ambiguous. But how I understand it is, it is effectively saying you you should follow the roadbook. Um, so you know, if he's maliciously choosing not to follow the roadbook, then so be it. I mean, he, the other thing that's confusing for me with Benavides is the first thing he said was, "Ah, oh, my GPS didn't didn't click over on this waypoint," and, and the first penalty they gave him was for not passing through a waypoint because his GPS didn't register. And then it comes out about this different route. Well, then so he which is it? so then he it's kind of a little bit of an odd, odd way to do it. But then he he took to Instagram and he made a video which we got translated. Um, and yeah, he basically in that he says, "Ah, oh, actually, what happened was this and this, and I didn't really know it was against the rules and blah." And he tried to kind of talk his way out of it. But between like the initial penalty being given to him and like 12 hours later, his story changed completely. He got, he got a three hour penalty and effectively his race was over. And then in the same day, Ricky Brabeck's engine blew up, which was undoubtedly, and in, like for anyone that was a fan and wanted Honda to win, you were like especially like I, super gutted because he seems like a really- like Yeah, a, and, and, not, and I don't kind of fanboy so much of a Honda, but th over don't him- Don't lie, mate. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I think with Ricky, I can I think we identify him with the most because he's just he's just a kid who loves riding his dirt bike. He loves playing with his remote control cars and like he's just a really down to earth guy. So, to, um, yeah, to see him like that is like it's pretty heartbreaking. We uh we got the video. Mm. I feel like we've uh, lost the video. Oh, we saw it in the stage some in the summary at the start. Yeah, 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 they showed it at the start. Yeah. It was the bit where there was a Honda and he was looking like he was going to cry and he was moan like sad about it. And yeah, it, was, it wasn't great. Um, so in that one day, basically, Honda's best chance of even a podium finish was wiped out completely. Their, their leading rider, the guy leading the race, easily gone. Benavidez, gone for cheating. Which is just super, a super odd thing to do. Like, they had the same problem two years ago. It's a very Honda thing to do, though, isn't it? Yeah, so two years ago, basically, for a little context, is they, they made a huge mistake in that there was a, a stage with the neutralization section in the middle of it. So the stage was split in two by a public road. But when they do that in Dakar, the stage rules don't change. The clock's just not running. So you're given a time to get from the end of one stage to the start of the next. All the rules are the same. And the whole Honda team went into a petrol station and refueled their bikes. Now, the point of this being an advantage for them is that they can run way less fuel in both stages and their bikes handle way better because they're running 15 kilos less in weight um, and it's pretty clear in the road book that you're only allowed to fuel in the regulation sorry that you're only allowed to fuel where you're allowed to fuel so where they tell you where they put fuel bowsers out and make you stop to fuel your bike um, Honda messed that up somehow the biggest most expensive team in the world didn't know that that was a rule or didn't think they were going to get caught and, and this feels like exactly the same thing, like sticking notes to your fuel tank so that they don't check your road book and then riding through all the checkpoints without thinking you're gonna get caught seems like, an, a, like a dumb thing to do. And whether he went out on his own or not, it's just a dumb thing I, to do. I, I think the thing with Benavidez on this day, he knew at the start that it was the last day that you can actually make any positions up because the day after that was a, a mass start and the day after that was reverse order in, in the general classification. So, and he was like, I think he was about a quarter of an hour back at this point. So he's kind of got not very much to lose in, in, hit, you know, in Honda's mind at the start of the day. Their lead riders at the top of the field, they're winning. They, they don't know their engine's gonna go. So Benavidez, doesn't really matter. Kind of just throw caution to the wind a little bit and try something. 
it's not saying it's the right thing to do, but kind of, I think that's why they did it. But can, can you imagine KTM doing that? Like, can you imagine this being Flip River? I mean, the other thing is that there is always that well, conversation about KTM. A few years ago, they were, when they had the two biggest riders in Mark Comer and Cyril Dupre, pretty much every year it was won by who figured out who was cheating. Um, so one year it was Mark Comer, he changed his tire in the middle of the stage and then Cyril's team complained and then the next year Cyril went back to get some gloves that he forgot and Mark complained and he won. Um, so also, this is very speculative, but would it surprise you if it was actually someone from KTM that took that photo and put it in and made the complaint and, or maybe they just mocked a Honda up and put it on there? <laughs> Obviously, that's a joke. Nobody well, that. it was that photo was taken at a checkpoint. It's so a super weird photo. There would have been other riders there. If he's if he's stationary, he's, he's neutralized. So there'll be other riders there. So I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. I'll see if I've got it. I've lost at, at least one of the organisation, for sure. I've lost my emails, but we'll uh, we've got the photo here. This is it's super unexciting. I'm not telling you my password. <laughs> So here it is. Thanks to Mr. Ben Lucarelli. There's the picture of, of the notes on his bike. Like, it's not subtle in any way. Like, I mean, he even colored them in. <laughs> Might as well have had like a neon sign with like <laughs> cheating on it or something. Yeah, so somehow he managed to cover those up at the start as well. Um, so yeah, that was not a great day for Honda. And pretty much their race is gone. Like their next nearest rider is in like 10th place. Yeah. Job's done. And then it comes down to a race of Yamaha had Adrian Van Beveren, their star rider, running in fourth place, mm -hmm. just a couple of minutes off the lead. And then KTM have got, basically in KTM Husqvarna terms, they've got like one, two, four and five dialed. Like they're in a really good place. All of a sudden the whole race is on its head and it looks like, it's kind of, it blew it wide open as well because where it looked like Brabeck was in to win, now the gaps are really small. They were like, the top three were a minute apart. It was like, Nobody knew what was going to happen. I don't know if you guys watched this on the TV, but I was, I was pretty excited. Um, so it's, it's, day nine was a mass start again. Uh, yeah, and uh, it was a, a day with a mass start and also a day with really difficult navigation. Like a lot of those top guys were, um, were kind of taking chances and a lot of guys getting lost. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you'll see. I don't know if you guys saw the footage, but there was a there was a bit where a lot of them were looking for a waypoint, and one of the guys kind of found a way, and looked back over his shoulder to see if any of the other guys had seen him find the way, and like at the last minute, Walkner spotted him and kind of shot after him. So it's like it's really funny to watch that kind of stuff because it's proper it's proper cat and mouse kind of things. Mm. Yeah, totally. It was a. Uh I, I really enjoyed it as well. I thought this year was like super good to watch for those reasons. And then uh, ba basically the end of that day finished with Toby Price one minute in the lead from his teammate, not teammate, Pablo Quintanilla. Volkner was like six minutes back, but still in theory within a shot. And it's the first time in years where the last day has actually been a stage where people were racing for something. Quite often the last day has become this agreed procession that the, 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 the route has been on like farm tracks, so it's dusty, it's hard to make time, and it almost becomes like a Tour de France sort of scenario where there's no fight for the general classification, it's just people from like fifth place down having to go at each other and no one really cares. Um, but this year was an open fight, 100Ks, whoever won that stage was gonna win the race, and then the organizers did something that I don't think they announced before the start of the race, I never read it anywhere, but basically the top 10 bikes went after everyone else. Yeah. So all the bikes had gone, all the cars had gone, and then they put the last 10 bikes in after the, everything else. So the tracks are there, the route is done, and I don't know, it was, it was unbelievable. Like we watched it pretty much live. Yeah. You know, we were watching the live feed, maybe that's a bit sad. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, basically Pablo and Toby started three minutes apart and they knew that they had to beat each other and it went balls to the wall. And that huge crash you saw at the start, which I seem to have lost. Worth Here seeing is. again. This is a man that is pretty desperate to win his first Dakar. Like he knows about that drop about 50 yards beforehand. You can watch him slam on the brakes, watch the back end of the bike squat and he has to give it gas to get 
realizes wheel up. about there. He's like, oh no. Slam on, gas, wheel up. Yeah, you stay down, son. <laughs> oh my god. My favorite bit about this is how Toby accidentally filled him in as he <laughs> rode away. Came to check he was all right, filled him in, just to remind him that he wasn't gonna win. Um, so on the, on the question of toughness points, he broke his ankle in that crash, and he looked at his bike for a bit, and then he got back on, and he rode for another hour, pretty much. He still, he still only lost 20 minutes on the day, which in an hour with a broken ankle is not bad. Then he rode another 200 kilometers down the road with a broken ankle to get his finish. Yeah, I think he had a, a morphine drip or something at the finish line. Nice. They had, I saw him putting something in his arm. <laughs> Dude, I could Maybe do Maybe it was one of those a bit mistakes. stronger than morphine, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty, I, yeah, it's pretty insane. He ended up finishing fourth, which is pretty, I think it's, it's yeah, cruel. Brutal. It's cruel. Yeah, yeah. It's really cruel. I mean, you broke your ankle running in the dark once, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> well, wasn't it also naked? <laughs> Uh, not <laughs> carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it ended up. I don't know. Yeah, it ended up with Toby winning. Who is a beast? He is a beast, and and he's he goes into that category of a little bit stupidly tough as well because he broke his wrist three weeks before the start, had it pinned, and then rode the whole race with a broken wrist and still won, which is insane. You rode you rode a Dakar with a freshly broken scaphoid. And uh, you didn't stop moaning about it for <laughs> uh, eight years. Five years. Yeah. Still, still going. Yeah, no, but still you, going. Can, I mean, you, you know what it's like to do that. Maybe you should, yeah. Maybe you can give us some insight. No, I, I, yeah, I don't think I do know what it's like to do that because uh, <laughs> my situation was definitely different because uh, I wasn't trying to win the race. I was trying to survive it. But, but for sure, it's unbelievable what he did. You know, can you, can you imagine that? Literally, it was less than four weeks, wasn't it, from mm. the point he broke his scaphoid and... There's pictures of it on the internet again, like really properly broken in half and then pinned and then mm. going and winning that race. So it's just like, that's got to be, for me, that's like, that's not just winning Dakar. That's one of the greatest sporting achievements ever, I think. I think it's out, uh, astonishing what he's done. No, no question. I mean, the guy's yep. definitely going to be one of the greatest, uh, I don't think just Dakar races, you know, people don't realise again with all, all those top guys, like when we talked about how hard the terrain is, you know, they've all come from, you know, World Enduro or World Motocross and like Toby's, because he's grew up in Australia and he didn't do World Enduro, people don't realise the level he was at, but, you, you know, he's won in Extreme Enduro, Supercross, Motocross, um, kind of everything except trials, he's won, desert racing. Pie eating. Pie eating. Yeah, he's super good <laughs> pie eating. Um, you know, so yeah, to, but yeah, to even line up at, uh, on that race and, and attempt to do what he did was astonishing and to win it is mind blowing yeah, yeah it's and it, you know like we talk a, a little bit about the tactics there at the start but I, I, I kind of disagree with you about that I think I think actually you know the level's so high at the front there now that those guys are going hard I think there's less tactics than there was I think they're all pushing really hard a lot of the time and for me you saw that actually after Sam got his penalty and suddenly he goes, all right, I can't win anymore and I'll, I'll ride at a normal pace. And he's like 14 minutes slower the next day. I think they're all going mad fast. And I think Toby is on another level to the rest of them. And I think the problem was that he's riding 85, no, he's riding 90% of his pace because he's got broken wrist and they're all just still trying to beat him. That's what I think. I mean, you know, the last day when it was, he hadn't won a stage, he'd just ridden with those guys with a broken wrist for, nine days and then the last day when it actually counted um, and he had to ride fast because there was a minute in it he smoked everybody he won by two and a half minutes that day and he beat the fastest car by 12 minutes like that's out of this world and he, and he did that knowing that Quintanilla had yeah. Yeah. was down on the ground so he, he just had to cruise to the finish but now he kind of wanted to kind of put his stamp on it and that's yeah, yeah. that's super impressive yeah so uh it ended up with a KTM one two five one two three four five or a Husky four five, but let's be honest, it's a KTM, um, which is basically I don't know if anyone was here when we uh, did our predictions last time, but <laughs> one of us called that. Ugh. Boring. How, many, on, did, how many did you get right now? Boring. I, I mean, you picked five, five yeah. for the top three, which is Braybrook would do well. He did well. Until he finished. Uh, I thought we were predicting just... next year's oh, race. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I what, think... what, when Brabeck's on a KTM, you mean? 
So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's really important like, as well that we go back over a few things. So one of the biggest talking points... What, so that you could prove you're right again? I'm always right. <laughs> when are you going to realize this? Um, one of the biggest things that was talked about before the race was the rule changes. And essentially, it looks like on paper that this, for the top guys especially, was one of the safest Dakars that there's been in years. Like, there wasn't that scenario where we're sat at the end and we're like, wow, all the top guys, like the, the people that are left are the ones that just stayed upright. You know, this year it was the ones that are left are the ones whose engines didn't blow up and they didn't go the wrong way. Um, so it comes back or to that cheat. question. Or cheat. It comes back to that question of, does it need to be made safer or does that kind of come from the riders themselves starting to decide that they don't need to ride like that? Or, yeah, I mean, what do you think? You, you look, <laughs> you look I, I don't know, I'm just here to look pretty. I said that last <laughs> time. Um, <laughs> I think the terrain sort of lent itself where you couldn't do much with the, the rules. I mean, sand, you've, yeah, you've got to ride fast anyway. Um, the speed's not real, a real problem. Um, like Simon said last time, if you're worried about the speed and the speed limit, then you're worrying about that and not riding. So, um, yeah, the rule changes for me. It's, it may be a little bit different if it's in, in a different country where the tracks are a little different, where it's wide open and... Yeah, other things like that. But to be honest, yeah, I think they should keep it as it is, just go somewhere else. <laughs> okay, so uh, there was an interview that came out. Or, well, what do you think about first? What do you think about safety? Like, you, you've got more experience. You've been through all those eras of safety changes and strange rules and, yeah. I, I, I think for the bikes, the, the, the dunes are often safe. Like, you do see the hot, the, the horror one and you do see, you know, the guys tip over the top of dunes and have that horror crash. But for the most part, even when it's high speed in the dunes, I, I think it is a little bit safer. There, there's definitely, you know, there's danger in that race. We've said it loads of times. It doesn't matter which way you look at it. It's a dangerous race. Um, but, you know, perhaps compared to Morocco, for example, when there's a lot of high speed and rocks and hidden traps and washouts, you know, you know those broken femurs of the last few years with the big guys, they've often been them going into those sort of hidden traps and the bike chasing them into the ground a little bit. So m maybe it's a bit the terrain. I mean, there was, there was a few injuries in cars this year, which is sort of the opposite side for the cars. Cause yeah, quite a lot of backs, car, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, the car guys, when they have those big spectacular you know, roll over five, six, seven times in the desert, they've got massive roll cages and you kind of look at the cars and go, I wish I was in a car, it's much safer than the bikes. But actually, you, you know, in the dunes, it, it's a different problem for the cars because they come over the dunes and, you know, really G out in the, in the bottom. And there was, I, I don't know, there was, I can't remember how many, but there was definitely several back injuries in the car side. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, you're not going to make the race safe, are you? <laughs> Do you think the, the rules that they propose to change do make it safer though? Or do you think they're just changes for the sake of making changes? The, the mooses and the speed limit and the kind of tire control and that, that stuff? No, no, I don't, think, I don't think that's a bit that's gonna make it safer. It's a succinct answer there. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. I think it's more it about the, again. the selection really. If, if, um, if the rider's not up to it, they shouldn't ride there. And that's really brutal, but... Um, yeah, people have crashes when they're tired. And if, if you're not at a level or standard to ride the race, then maybe that's, that's what they should be thinking. So we have this conversation again in 12 months? Brilliant, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> so, a uh, couple of other things that have been brought up. Um, about 10 seconds after the event ended, there was an interview with Levine, the guy that runs the event. He's the guy from ASO who's kind of, I think he's, well, I don't know what his technical title is, Le Grand Fromage, something like that. <laughs> um, no offense to any French people here. Um, yeah, and about 10 seconds afterwards, he came out saying that he basically, it read like, I wanted to stay in South America, but we want three countries. Um, we want them to be three new countries, which was like the exact opposite of what he said 10 minutes after Dakar one year ago. When he, were, when he was suggesting that it should go to Africa and be in some strange African country in the middle of nowhere. Um, yeah, so again, like you know ASO better than most people. What is going on? I, I, yeah, I think it's actually really hard to know because before they have always seemed to have this, uh, this kind of big long-term plan and be quite, quite sort of openly secretive about it. But it does seem that, like that interview was very bizarre because it does seem like they actually don't know what they're going to do with the race and like it's kind of 
quite worrying from the whole event's point of view that they, they don't have a plan and their only plan is is to see who'll stump up enough money for the race to go there. And uh, again, for people that don't realise, but the countries that that race goes to it is all about funding. You know, they're, they're, the story is uh, we don't, we'll never know exactly the numbers, but it's around five million euros to have the race come through your country. So hence it only ended up in one country this year. And uh, back in kind of April, May, it was all actually up in air, like per the Peru had even pulled out and they had nowhere to go and there was all these sort of emergency talks and um, yeah, a lot, a lot of competitors that had paid their money were panicking on the internet that there wasn't even gonna be a race, but then there was, it was, it was rescued. We don't know financially how it was rescued. But, you know, that's definitely a quite a worry because you, you look at the South American countries they've been running it in since 2009 and they've all quite clearly now got no money, you know, you know with the economic situation in most of those, uh, those countries. They've definitely not got, got 5 million euros to throw at the Dakar. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's really hard to know what they're going to do. But it does, it does seem like there is a little bit of a crisis there. Mm. All right. Yeah. So... Last question is kind of once again back in a circle. So where do you guys want it to be? Uh, can we do it in a Welsh forest? <laughs> Super comfortable. Really probably stay at home most nights. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I quite like riding in South America. I think it's an awesome place to ride. And I, I like the idea that the terrain is, the terrain is not Africa. It's summer for a start, which even though it's hotter, is generally nicer. You've got more daylight. It, it's a little bit in my our favor, but it, it, I think it makes life a little bit easier. Um, and South America is an awesome place to ride a motorbike. Like the people there love it. Um, it was one of the coolest things that you see every year. I think uh, you saw at the start this year there was like a million people turned out. It was insane. And I think if you go to other parts of the world, they just don't care that much. Um, and it kind of takes away from it feeling so special if that makes sense um like riding through a small village in africa and having them throw stones at you is nowhere near as fun as the opposite you know i don't know about you but it's not my favorite thing to do on a sunday so um yeah have you got i'd like to go to australia again yes riding <laughs> <laughs> i think it'd be brilliant that place is empty Dakar and Austin, <laughs> i fl right. flew over from melbourne to cairns there's nothing in the middle there's nothing <laughs> it'd be brilliant wow. <laughs> um uh, doesn't really bother me. I, I don't know what Africa's like. I, well, I hope I'll find out in Mazuga. Um, and I don't like, know what South America's like. So, uh, yeah, I'm whatever. Don't mind. Not fast. Okay. So the last, the last kind of question of, of note is, uh, is based around KTM once again. We, I feel like we had the same question two weeks ago and the same question one year ago. But how does anyone beat them? And... Is it possible? And when's it going to happen? And who's it going to be? And like, I want hard and fast predictions so that once again in one year's time, I can lord it over you. Well, we've, we've kind of bashed Honda a lot tonight, but there was another team that was in with the shadow winning and they messed it up as well. And that was Yamaha. Um, yeah, Van Beveren and Desautre, uh, kind of they're not kind of big duck on names a few years ago, but they're absolutely rapid French beach racers. And um, Franco Caimi, again, Argentinian guy, really strong rally rider. And Rodney Fagata, who's an Aussie, another awesome Aussie racer, who's like, he's won just about everything there is to win in Oz. Especially Ish. desert racing. Yeah, exactly that, yeah. Um, I think the first of Yamaha's problems, they were, I don't think they should have let Caimi ride. He broke his femur three months before the start of the Dakar and then started and went out on day three because it was too much pain for him to take. Um, and I think Yamaha should have just been a bit more executive at the start of it and just not let him ride. Um, and I, th I think they should have had five bikes on the line, um, much like KTM do, much like Honda do. And it's not just five bikes in the Honda team. There's a couple of Honda South America bikes, which are basically factory bikes as well. And see with KTM, there's a, a list of factory bikes there. And with Yamaha, there was just the, the four of them. Um, three when Kaimi went out. So yeah, I think Kaimi's ride was a bit wasted. And there's a load of people that they could have had in that, in that seat on the, on, the, on the Yamaha guys that they've already got contracted like 
uh, Luke Lario in the in DOGP and um, Jamie McCanny. Jamie and, McCanny. Yeah. yeah, there's a load of guys that ride for factory teams, for like factory Yamaha teams in Australia, in America, in France, all over the place that would have would have killed for one of those rides. And I think, yeah, not having enough bikes there that they thought would finish was, was kind of not doomed from the start, but they were starting on the back foot. I mean, if anyone from Yamaha is watching this, I'll ride your bike for yeah, you. Yeah, we'll so ride them, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Please, yeah. like, I'll be a great water boy. I'll just turn up at some point, someday. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the last thing that uh, we always kind of like to talk about um, is the privateers. I don't, I don't think there's much more to say about that in, in, with the, the whole KTM scenario. Just it is what it is until someone it's else a does a better job. They're, they're going to they're gonna keep winning. Um, yeah, the last kind of the last kind of point is to talk about a few of the privateers. Obviously, on the British side, Sam was third overall. Sam Sunderland, which is an awesome result. It's the first time he's finished. He's not a privateer, obviously, but it's the first time he's finished a race that he didn't win. Um, and he just put he put a really solid race together the whole time. He didn't look wild. He didn't make any silly mistakes. Um, he was a little bit unlucky, and yeah, he did a great job. Uh, one of the one of the best British privateers at the moment is a guy called Max Hunt. Um, he's finished twice. Dakar now, um, and this year he rode in the originals by Motul class, which is basically the Malmoto class, um, and he led up until the rest day. Unfortunately, he had a crash on day five, yeah. um, and just totaled his bike. From what we from what we know, he's fine, but yeah, he destroyed his bike. And and the other one was Richard Main, um, which is a, a little bit of a sad story because he ground out nine or eight and a half days of riding, and then on day nine, so a day from the end of the race. Um, he had a crash, he went off the back of a dune that was a bit bigger than he thought and uh, smashed into the ground on the other side. And, uh, he, unfortunately, he's not in a great way. Um, he's got a broken pelvis and a couple of broken vertebrae and a little bit of, a, a little bit of other issues. Um, if you do care about that, he, uh, he's got a Just Giving page where he's kind of trying to raise a bit of money to cover the fact that he's now broken and unemployed, um, which is, yeah, a little right. bit of a dark side of the whole thing. Um, but yeah, if you want, you can find it on, fa on his Facebook page. Um, yeah, and that's probably that's probably about all there is to say about this year's rally. I think, unless uh, what, what go through you? the uh, women's class briefly. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. yeah. So Laya, obviously, the queen of Dakar, nine straight finishes. Wait, that's more than you. It is, isn't nine it? Nine finishes. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. So, yeah, nine finishes are about thirteen, fourteen stages per race. So like over a hundred Hey Neil, you should do this maths, mate. Hundred and twenty five consecutive yeah. Dakar stage finishes. That's that. pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's incredible. Yeah. And know. and and she finished eleventh outright. Yeah. Which is like I don't know, it's legit. Yeah. It's yeah. Fully, it's just fully legit. Awesome. Anyone that's in the top twenty is a legitimately incredible rider. Like that's not us. Yeah. And then there was um Miriam Paul, who we forgot to mention last time. She was second. Uh third place female was also probably finished i ten eight or nine yeah well she's been now. a long time yeah, she? long yeah. time yeah yeah in fact she helped me drag that out of the dune that's how oh, long wow. she's been doing it for how strong is she <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, she she made a mistake because she was on a 450 yamaha and we were both stuck in this dune set and did that thing of let's help each other <laughs> and i went and helped her pick up her 450 yamaha and then she come and help me pick this thing up she had no idea what she was getting herself in <laughs> You're a horrible person. <laughs> Did you laugh at that the whole time as no, well? No, I was pleased. I stayed with her all day. She was strong. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Anastasia Nifontova was the first woman to finish the Malmoto class ever. Um, unfortunately, one of the other girls in that class didn't finish. She went out on day four. That was Sarah Garcia. Mm. And then lastly, there was Gabrielle Novotna, who finished at her second attempt. So. Awesome Solid. stuff. So, anyone else got any pearls of wisdom to add to... John Bereda, 2020 winner. Absolutely. <laughs> just, I would literally put all four pennies that I've got on that never happening. Um, so.